Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. I hope everybody's doing well out there. I wanted to rant a little bit today about one of the most tricky and confusing and misleading and deceiving words in all of the Bible. Um, it has caused great chaos, great confusion. Uh, it has um, really been the sort of the, the center of all confusion, honestly. I mean, there, there's other words that are right up there ranking with it. Uh, for instance, Gentiles, which is one of the most misleading words in all of Scripture. Um, but this particular word is equally, if not more, deceiving because it sets the, the tone for this mass confusion that we have today. And the word is Hebrew word zera, zera, Z-E-R-A. Sometimes it's spelled Z-E-R-A-H. But this word in the Hebrew means seed, descendants, offspring, uh, posterity, children. Sometimes it can be referred to, uh, referring to like a, a plant. Um, you know, like you plant a seed in the ground and something grows. But without exception, this word is always used to speak of something that comes from another, right? Uh, uh, it's never used in a spiritual sense at all, right? It's always used physically. It's always talking about offspring, children, descendants. Um, and that's true throughout the Old Testament straight through. You will not find one instance in the Old Testament where this word zera, and believe me, it is used a bunch. I, I didn't do a, a word count, um, but if you do a word study on this, you'll see that it's probably used, you know, easily 100, 200 times in the Old Testament. And it's never used for a spiritual, you know, connotation. It's never used in a spiritual sense. It's always used to speak of offspring, children, descendants that come from the body. Now, why is this word so deceiving and so misleading? Well, because Christianity today bases its understanding or models its understanding off of the promise to Abraham, right? And they say, well, the promise was that in Abraham's seed, many nations will be blessed. Therefore, we know that we can't claim hold to being a physical descendant of Abraham, so it must be spiritual, right? And they go to places like Romans 4 um, to kind of back that or prove that, if you will. Um, and they say, look, it says that, you know, the promise wasn't to Abraham and his seed through the law, but it was through faith. Yes, that's correct. But that's a very misleading and tricky statement because the promise still doesn't extend outside of the physical seed of Abraham, the chosen seed, right? Now, obviously, you're probably understanding that as spiritual seed, being a Christian today, but I can assure you that that was never the intention of the word, right? We need to go back to the foundational places where this promise was made and really take a hard look at how this word zera, seed, is used, right? Because that's going to form, form our understanding when we come to the last days and we see Paul referring to Abraham's seed, right? The chosen ones, the, the elect, the ones who are uh, being, you know, given this inheritance, this promise. So Paul in Romans 4 is not saying that it's to any Joe Blow through faith. Paul is saying that the promise wasn't to Abraham and his physical seed Israel through the law. It was actually to Abraham and his physical seed Israel through faith. So you had to be uh, of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you had to have faith. That's all that Paul is saying. He's not saying that it opens up to Eskimos and Africans and the white man, like these black Hebrew Israelites like to call us. He's not saying that. He's saying, you know, it's still to Israel. It's just to Israel through faith. So we have to be really careful about that, okay? And, you know, people will make the argument, well, it says that Christ is the seed, the singular seed. Well, yes, it does say that, but it also says that there was a plural seed, a multiple seed that had to be saved, that was getting the promise, right? Paul in Romans says, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed. And if you translate that, it's all the chosen ones, right? So the promise was through Christ, the singular seed, yes, but the promise had to be sure to all the seed, the plural seed, which was Israel. So um, we got to be really careful. But let's go back to the foundational points. And we see that uh, there's this promise that in Abraham's seed, Zerah, 
many nations will be blessed. So the thing we have to ask each everybody or ask ourselves is if this word never was changed to, to mean, you know, spiritual descendants, which is just a wacky concept in and of itself, right? What is a spiritual descendant? It makes no sense, but this is what they hang their hats on. Um, but if this has had never been changed in the first place, and we just allowed the text to say what it was saying, right? Physical descendants, bodily descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would we have ever come to this conclusion or this mass religion of Christianity? I don't think we would have, right? If we go to the promise of Abraham, right, back when it started where, you know, God gives him this promise that from his loins, uh, him and his wife will have a son or have a child, um, and they laugh. We know the, pro the, the you know, the picture. They, they kind of chuckle because they're both old, right? They're almost 100, I believe it is. And they're laughing because they're like, yeah, no way, I, I can't have a child, right? But God promised them that from Abraham's loins, he would have a child. It says that. And um, so they have this child, and obviously it's Isaac, and then it goes forward, and Isaac has Jacob, and then we see Jacob, and uh, he lays his hand on his son Joseph's head and tells Joseph that his son Ephraim will become a fullness of nations and be very, very great. A great multitude of nations, he promises him. So to me, that is exactly where that promise to Abraham that in his descendants, in his literal bodily descendants, his offspring, many nations will be blessed because at the end we see Ephraim gathered in. He's the great multitude. He's the fullness of nations that Paul said in Romans 11 would come in resulting in all Israel saved. So that's how the, the whole promise came to fruition. But back to the to the point that I'm trying to make here, this word zera is the most misunderstood word, probably right right alongside of Gentiles. If if zera had been kept in its proper physical seed context, we would have never had these issues, right? We wouldn't be you know fighting today. Everybody would understand that yes, this promise actually was uh, for Israel, right? Because they were the physical descendants of Abraham, right? And that's who it was for. Um, but if we look at some of these examples of the word zeta used in the Old Testament, we can ask ourselves if there's any spiritual connotation whatsoever, right? Okay, let's look. Um, and Adam, this is Genesis 3.15, and Adam put, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son. Okay, so there's the, the you know, childbirth, and called his name Seth, for God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. Seed there is Zera. Now, is that a literal seed, physical offspring, or is that a spiritual descendant? You decide. Okay, look at Genesis 7, 3. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the earth. Seed is Zera there. Is that to keep spiritual animals alive upon the earth? Or is that to keep literal physical animals and bear physical offspring alive upon the earth? Well, you decide. Genesis 9, 9. And behold, he's talking to Noah. I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Zedah. Now, is he telling Noah that he would establish his seed, uh, his promise with Noah's spiritual descendants or actual Noah's offspring? You decide. Genesis 12, 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed, Zerah, will I give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Now, the word is Zerah there. Now, is that spiritual seed or spiritual uh, seed that he was going to give the land of Canaan to? No, obviously we know who that went to, right? That went to Israel. So that was his physical seed. It had nothing to do with spiritual sense or spiritual application. You decide, right? You have to make these decisions. Genesis 13, 16, And I will make thy seed, Zeta, as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed, Zeta, also be numbered. Well, who's that? Well, we know it's, it's Israel because that was actually fulfilled in Israel through Moses. Moses said that you had become like the stars of heaven in number, like the sand on the seashore, like the dust of the earth in number. They had become so great. And so this again proves that there's no spiritual connotation whatsoever in the world in the word zera in the Old Testament. It was always physical seed, it was always offspring. 
Genesis 15, 5, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou shalt be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall your seed Zeta be again fulfilled in Israel. So again, we're, I'm just proving that Zeta was used when God gave Abraham the promise, right? But here we have numerous instances of Zeta being used to speak of Israel. So is it likely that Zeta in one in one usage is speaking of spiritual descendants, but then Zeta in all these other usages is actually referring to the children of Israel? No, it's highly unlikely, and that's wrong, right? We have to be consistent. Zeta is used the same way throughout. It's always used to speak of literal descendants, literal offspring. Let's read a couple more. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed, Zedah, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them four hundred years. Well, folks, again, who is the Zedah? Is it spiritual Israelites or is it actual Israelites? The physical seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, you decide. Genesis 16, 10, And I in the Lord said, I will multiply thy seed, Zeta, exceedingly, that it shall be not be numbered for multitude. Again, was he talking about spiritual seed there, or was he talking about physical seed, Israel? Obviously, we know this is numerously, numerous times fulfilled in Israel. We see that being said everywhere uh, in the Old Testament. So there's no confusion as to who the Zeta, the seed, actually is. Let's read a few more here. And I will establish my covenant. This is Genesis 17, 7. I will establish my covenant between me and your seed, Zeta, after you, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto them. Now, was God telling Abraham that he would establish his covenant between him and spiritual descendants? No, he was telling him that he would establish his covenant between him and his literal bodily descendants that descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Consistency is key, folks. Okay. Leviticus 18, 21, Thou shalt not let any of thy seed, Zeta, pass through the fire of Moloch, neither shalt thy pro thou profane the name of the Lord God. This was, again, a law that was given to Israel, that their children should not pass through the fire of Moloch. Again, was this saying that spiritual descendants could not, not pass through the fire of Moloch, or literal descendants of Israel could not pass through the fire to Moloch? You decide. That's cute. There's, there's so many. I'm just skipping over all of them because I just want to give you some variations and not just repeat the same thing over and over again. Leviticus 24. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Moloch and kill him not. Again, seed, Zeta. Is that children or is that spiritual children? You decide. Leviticus 21, 17. Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations... That hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer this bread to God. Again, is that spiritual descendants offering bread to God, or is that the literal descendants of Israel? You decide. Uh, let's take a look here. Do, 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 do. Got a few more. But if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child, Zeta, and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth, she shall eat of her father's meat, but there shall be no stranger to eat thereof. Again, is this speaking of the priest's daughter giving birth to a spiritual child or a literal child? Pretty clear, right? And this is all just common sense stuff. Numbers 5.13, And a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from her, the eyes of her husband. Oh, that's the wrong one. Sorry, that doesn't have the word in it. I don't know why I had that there. But there's so many, right? Just please do a word study on the word Zera, right? Uh, Z-E-R-A in the Hebrew Bible. And you will see emphatically that every time this word is used in the Old Testament, it speaks of literal offspring, literal physical bodily descendants. Never once does it have any spiritual connotation at all. Never once is the word spiritual even connected to this word at all in the Old Testament. It's never even enjoined. It's never uh, even said probably at all in the same paragraph. <laughs> Yet you have a whole theology, a whole religion based today on that concept that these are spiritual descendants of Abraham 
that are be, uh, that are inheriting a promise that was never intended for them. It was intended for the actual, literal, physical, bodily descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is why I say that this word is responsible for utter confusion and utter chaos. Just like the word Gentiles, which is actually better translated as nations, nation, people, peoples, tribe, tribes. Those are the better translations. Yet, some, for some reason, people see that word Gentile and they automatically think non-Israelite. But that's just because they don't understand the dynamics of the story. They don't understand the terminology, right? A Gentile was simply someone not practicing Torah. It was anyone outside of Torah, Israelites included. So that's why Paul's mission and Jesus' mission was to go to the Jew and the Gentile, because God was seeking them out of both parties, the Israelites. And that would fulfill the promise to Abraham that in his literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, many nations would be blessed, because that's precisely what we see taking place in the end, when Ephraim, the multitude or the fullness of nations, is gathered back to their God. So you see how that story comes full circle. It's pretty cool, right? But again, people would like to change the meaning of simple and clear words to reinvent the wheel and have this spiritual, you know, idea that absolutely is foreign to any part of the text. And they use one, two, maybe three passages in the New Testament to try to prove it. Now, obviously, we know uh, from a proper perspective that you just need a little tweak, like a little back adjustment when you go to the chiropractor and you can actually see those passages in their proper light, right? But but instead they cling to those two or three passages to say, look, it's it's not of, it has nothing to do with the law, right? It has to do with faith. So therefore we're Abraham's descendants by faith, but it always had to do with descendants. It always had to do with Zeta. In your seed, Zeta, in your descendants, many nations will be blessed. That's the whole point. In your literal bodily descendants, many nations would be blessed. Just think about that. Let that soak in. Let that promise to Abraham soak in. In your descendants, many nations would be blessed. How can anyone argue with that? How can anyone say that that doesn't mean exactly what it says? In your descendants. In other words, your descendants are going to become nations and be blessed. Hence why we see this happening at the end. Hence why Paul is seeking the fullness of the nations to result in all Israel saved. Like he says in Romans 11, it would be at that time when the deliverer came out of Zion and turned ungodliness away from Jacob. And folks, Jacob is all 12 tribes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like of Ruski. If not, take a hike of Ruski, and we'll catch you on that next one. Take care, everybody, and remember, get people to understand the word Zeta because it's a game changer. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.